Okay. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Brad Whalen. I'm the director of operations for the school district. We also have our two co-chairs, Stacy Stanek and Phil Hom. And we're going to give you a brief presentation on a committee that the board formed in January to explore potential bond projects. And then we'll be making a recommendation. At this point in time, we haven't made any decisions as of yet. So this is one of the reasons why we're providing these presentations, to gain input from the community and basically provide that input back to the committee and kind of see what, um, you know, what you guys think. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stacy. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Brad said, my name is Stacy Stanek, and I'm one of the community members that are serving on this committee. And I, I want to stress tonight that we have not made any decisions as a committee. We're here to get input, we're here to get feedback so that we can then take it back to the committee and have our continued discussions. It is our job to put together the updated facility master plan and a prioritized list of projects to the school board for them to then decide for future bonds and future projects. Um, we've been working diligently, we're going to present it to the school board on June 11th, so feedback is important. So one of the first things that we did with the committee was provide feedback on the previous bond, because obviously that's important. Unfortunately, as everybody knows, um, the bond was not successful, but we hired a consulting firm to take a look at some areas for concern, and based on that, it was good for the committee to kind of gain that perspective. And so there are four main areas that the consulting firm identified based on the well over a thousand comments that we received from the community. The first one was what they termed financial reasons. That accounted for probably not much of a surprise, almost 50% of all the comments. These are not evenly spaced by any stretch of the imagination. And really those comments boiled down to two primary issues. One was the cost of the bond, which we asked for $104 million. The cost was a concern just in terms of community members thinking, wow, that's a big number. And it kind of scared some community members based on the comments that they received. The other, and actually probably the lion's share of most of the comments dealt in some way, shape, or form, it's a raise in taxes. Some folks from a fixed income said we can't afford a raise in taxes. Other folks raised the concern of our tax are already fairly high and this is another raise. And so a lot of those concerns um, were within the financial reasons area. The other area, bond package, accounted for about 25% of all the comments. That really boiled down to comments from the community on questioning what projects were in the bond or why certain projects were not in the bond, was really what most of those comments were. The other areas, communication and community satisfaction, kind of began to get into the weeds. The communication I'll briefly cover because that um, was kind of pervasive throughout a lot of the other comments too of just things the district could have maybe communicated better, letting the public know the information was on the website, just some miscommunication between what the community may have thought, the information that was there, and how we got that information out. And so with that, one of the things that the committee looked at was how do we solve at least some of the issues, one of them being the stable tax rate, a, a rise in taxes or keeping a stable tax rate. And so this chart shows what we have um, obligated already, the bars in gray, are what we have already paid off in terms of taxes from the, you know, from, or paid off in terms of the bond, excuse me, from the taxes that we've received in the past. The bars in orange are what we're projected to pay, and the reason I use the word projected is a bond is nothing like a mortgage. There's literally dozens of different factors that go into what ultimately that tax rate, the dollar rate per thousand, is going to be. And in fact, Katie Saul, our business manager, she does yeoman's work in terms of trying to keep that a fairly level, um, level playing field as we move outward into the into the future 
because there's so many factors that go into it. Population, assessed value throughout the community, growth or decline, of and as businesses come in, as people move in. Um, and that's just to name a few. But with the committee, you know, a lot of committee members notice there is a gap here in 2020. And so because of that gap, and the, the, these really don't equate to specific numbers, it's more just to show the committee and then to show the public that there is an opportunity that we can keep a stable tax rate while still obtaining some funds from the bond. The double-edged sword to that, though, is that the last bond for $104 million didn't fix all the problems even then. Times have changed, things have gotten more expensive, and the tax rate, that, the tax raise that we had there, obviously we're not looking at that, so this is gonna result in a lot less money, hence a lot fewer issues that we'll probably be able to solve in the future. And so that's one of the quandaries that the committee has looked at is how do we solve as many problems as we can knowing we're not going to be able to solve all of them. How do we solve as many problems as we can with, with the knowledge that we're going to have less funds. So none of these bars include the 104 million? Correct. Yeah, this is just, you know, just to show there is an opportunity because 104 million basically raised taxes by about 80 cents to 90 cents and it went pretty much straight across for you know several of the out years. Go ahead, Phil. I too would like to thank you for coming tonight. I wish it was uh, 5,000 more folks in the audience. Um, part of my job is to make this a little interactive, so I'll be asking you some questions. And I'm going to ask you a question about this. As um, uh, Brad mentioned, um, he didn't mention the number of dollars, but in reality, if you look at the long-term needs of the school district, we have about $250 million worth of projects. And of course, uh, if we keep the bond levy amount equal, uh, we certainly can't come close to uh, those, that number of dollars uh, to the project. But in, in fact, that also includes a new high school, which is $100 million so, uh, or more. So there's, there's a lot of projects. 20 on our list, uh, but um, I want to uh, mention that if we were to maintain a level tax rate, and through the, all the meetings that I've asked this question, they have primarily answered one way. And I'm going to ask you, so I'm not going to tell you what that is until I ask you the question. But I'm going to ask a philosophical question. I haven't done it every time because it's a kind of a difficult thing to understand, but I see the group tonight, I think you can understand that. So I'm just asking philosophically, not how much, just whether or not, okay? If you had a choice to keep your tax level the same, knowing that it's not gonna take care of all the issues in the district that are needed, versus willing to pay additional taxes, again, not a certain amount, a specific amount, but just more, what would you rather do, okay? Knowing again that keeping it the same will not take care of the issues that are needed in the district. Paying more will help do some of those, but not all of them. So if I were to ask you by a show of hands, would you favor more taxes or, let, or keeping them the same in the future? Okay, everybody with me? Who would want to pay more in taxes? Okay, it's a little different group tonight, okay? Probably because you're pretty so, well aware of some of the issues, yeah. So just on that question, of going rather would pay everybody would rather pay less but is what you're asking are we willing to pay more to reach those targets that are the need for the district or would we rather pay a stable tax rate and then not do those projects is yeah. that what you're asking so so yes yeah. so okay. again uh, if um, if you knew how many dollars were needed to take care of the issues in the district today or in the very near future would you be willing to pay more to take care of more of those needs or keep your taxes the same realizing that you'll be less likely to take care of even the, the distinct needs of today? Okay, so who would pay more, whatever that is, more? Yeah, my, my vote, I would be willing to pay more, but I'm not saying I would, I would be prepared or ready to pay as much more as it took to do all the projects. Oh no, oh no, oh no, I'm not asking. I'm just asking whether you, so the, 
Yeah, and, and, and we've had this discussion, Brad, and I, um, it's just whether or not, uh, if, if you want to keep your taxes the same, knowing that they would, if we did this, it will not take care of, of the basic emergency type needs of the district today or in the next few years versus willing to pay more to take care of some of those needs. That's basically what I'm asking. So again, the vote, pay more. Okay, so for the most part I see that, but I'll tell you across the district for most of the meetings, they don't want to pay more, okay? So those school board members that are in the audience tonight have to know that you're going to have some tough decisions to make. Particularly when you look at this graph and know that it's not until 2030 that you can ask for more money. So you're 13 years out, 12 years out before you can ask for more money if you keep them the same. So what's going to happen in 12 years? So if a bond was passed in 2020 to keep the, the blue bars, to keep the tax level the, the same, it's going to raise X number of dollars and be able to do some projects. But if you do that, and you want to keep it the same, then you can't go out until 2030 when you have those old bonds paid off and, and ask for more money. That's the problem, okay? Uh, it's 12 years away, and given what we know about the school district's growth, it's going to be very difficult, okay? All right, um, next slide. So here's the makeup of the committee and what our charge were, uh, was from the school board. Remember, we don't make any decisions. We provide information uh, and recommendations. You'll see up above there, we're first to identify the necessary projects that the school district has. Secondly, we need to prioritize these projects that the school district has identified or we've identified from the school district. And third, update the facility master plan. And that master plan, what that's all about is basically we're we were charged not to let's look at the needs of the school district today or tomorrow, but five years or 10 years down the road. And that'll give the school board, again, some glimpse of what we see the needs of the school district are in the future. Um, committee is made up of 35 members. Some of those members are in the audience tonight. 23 community members, Stacy and I are community members, school district administrators. Uh, Brad is one of those, and there's some uh, principals as well. And, some others, I think, school board members, uh, Josh, Dave, and Jenny. Jenny. Jenny, right. And then uh, the teacher, school union representatives, and last but not least, a representative from the architectural firm that the school district is hired to be part of this process. We had, thank you. <laughs> you won't let me have the button. Um, uh, we have three key uh, themes of the committee. And these three are enrollment of student capacity, condition of the facilities, and safety. And this is another one of these times I've asked people to interact with me to tell me what they thought was the most important without knowing the particulars. And I know many of you in here do know the particulars. But if you were to vote one time on what's the most important thing to you, of those three on the list, how would you vote? You only, like I say, you only get to vote once. So who would think enrollment of student capacity is the most important on that list? Okay, uh, condition of facilities. And how about student safety? Okay, um, so really interesting. Uh, just a couple of things that to mention here. Depending where I've been, there's been uh, most people voting for one or the other. It's hardly ever split. And I'll tell you the committee the committee, the, the, at least the community members of the committee, all voted, voted for number one, enrollment and student capacity. But I've been at schools where 100% safety. And at uh, West uh, High, uh, Sunset, Sunset. Uh, the PTO, um, I asked that question and they all said safety. And I looked at them and they're in a new school. And I said, do um, you, you feel your kids are unsafe? No then how come you voted that way if it was because of other kids in the district? They were concerned about other kids and other schools in the district. So I thought that was really interesting that they felt that way. But I'll just tell the school board members in the audience is that I have yet to see a consistent answer to most of the questions I've asked, except probably keeping the tax base the same. All right, next slide. I think that's, is that mine? 
Okay. Yeah, you can breathe. Okay, so <laughs> we've done everything so different sometimes. So if we look at enrollment and student capacity, this is a very interesting slide. So on the left side is our total enrollment in terms of students. On the bottom is the years across the bottom. I just said that. And that line, the black line, is the current or the, the past historical enrollment of the district up to, you can see, about 2017 uh, is where that last black box is. And that line going across the bottom one is total capacity without modular. So if you come over here and, and go straight up from there, you can see that, you know, without the modulars, we're already beyond capacity. And if we add the modulars to that upper line, so we do have capacity then out to about 2020, give or take, all right? So that's where we sit. With Without the modulars. the modulars, we are beyond capacity. With the modulars, we're right at capacity. Can you add any more? Modulars? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It just costs money. That's all it, okay. It you, and each modular provides two classrooms, about 60 kids, give or take an age group. The blue line is the, was that, the, that was the Portland State study? That yeah, so the, so that's, sorry, I forgot to tell you where this line came from. The black line, of course, is true numbers because that's what the enrollment's been. The purple is the expect, expected enrollment from the Portland State study from two or three years ago, two or three years ago. And so, and, and I would tell you that the, the facilities planning committee at that time, which I was a member of, we wrestled with the Portland State gave us three curves, a low growth, a medium growth, and a high growth rate. We struggled with that and came up, decided to go with the middle growth rate that we reported to the school board, but in fact, it's been closer to the high growth rate. All right, I think... Stacy. Stacy, okay. <laughs> So one of the main areas that we looked at as a committee are the conditions of the facilities. We took four tours, one of Highland, one of Rocky Heights, one of Sandstone, and one of Hermiston High. We went to Highland. There, um, I, I'm a proud alum. My kids go there. I'm well versed in the school. Um, maybe what some people see as challenges, I don't. Um, but there are challenges. One of them is parking, drop off, traffic. Um, there. Are, it, the school was built at a time when people were bused or walked to school. Most kids now are picked up or dropped off by parents, and very few ride the bus, at least in our area. Um, the other problem is that they don't have a commons area besides the one gym slash cafeteria. That was the one takeaway that Mr. Bacon said they would love the staff, is another area where they could keep the, the cafeteria area one and still be able to offer PE. And that is another ask at Rocky. It's the same problem. They're having to do PE sometimes in a classroom in inclement weather just because they can't run everything through. Uh, the other issue at Highland is going down 10th. It kind of spills over into Sandstone with their pickup and drop off time and their lack of an access point except off of 10th. And I've seen people pulling off of diagonal parking out in the sagebrush because there's not enough parking. That's a huge safety concern. You know, you've got the kids coming in and out, being dropped off, and the buses in the same area. At Rocky, um, I had only ever been in the gym. And when I went into the classroom, I, I didn't know, I, I didn't think, I didn't know what to think. There are temporary walls up. And there are a corner of each of the rooms where they're open. And we are very blessed as a school district that these teachers will do this job in that area. Um, I'm not sure how the kids can do it and the teachers, but they've managed, but it's not a solution. It's just really not. Um, the problem there again is the shared cafeteria and gym. They have the same drop off and pickup area issues. Uh, you know, just an aged facility in general. The next problem is sandstone. It is, while some people do view it as new, it is newer-ish. Um, we have access point problems. We have problems with the roof, which the school district is dealing with, but that's been a trickle down. When the bond passed to build that building, construction prices increased, and the school district was limited by the funds they had available. They did the best they could, but it is now 20 years old. So we're at the point where we need to do some major repairs, some major upgrades, and you know, really work on that school to make it livable for much longer. At the high school, 
The biggest problem there was student enrollment capacity. Every single classroom has a teacher and students in it. Uh, Mr. Spoo did indicate that we're graduating the smallest two classes in Hermiston School District and we're entering in the larger ones. They're running out of room. They are offering a ton of the CTE classes, which are the career training education courses, which are helping to draw students in, but they're having to turn students away because we don't have enough room. And when we come to that, we want to increase our graduation rate. We want to increase kids coming into the district. That's what's going to do it. But we don't have enough room. The last bullet point is student and safety. Okay. Student. Stacy, before oh. I go further, yeah. another chance to answer a question, OK? Oh. OK, I want Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. That's right. Um, so uh, alternative community is, uh, is a, a topic of, of importance to have a feel for. And that is, do we replace? Rocky Heights School District replaced Rocky Heights, Highland Hills, or both, okay? And I'll tell you the outcome of the times I've asked this question after I get your opinion, okay? <laughs> so again, you only get to vote once. So what's most important in that list? Uh, Rocky Heights or Highland or both, okay? We're doing both schools, so. And you who, only get one vote? You only get one vote. So who thinks that Rocky Heights is the most important, okay? How about Highland Hills? How about both? Okay, well, you didn't vote. Should I abstain? Well, no, you can't. <laughs> okay. All right, so you're, If you're a school board member, you can't do that. You gotta make a decision. <laughs> I've told people that in the past. So I'll just tell you, this is very interesting again, that uh, it's a mixed bag out there. Mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe a fraction more will go with Rocky Heights, but most just below that go for both. Good luck, school board. Yeah. So we did talk about safety and security. Chief Episton came in and gave a presentation to our group. There wasn't much to update from the previous bond committee because not many changes have been made. Um, the issues that he did discuss were um, the traffic concerns, which I have touched on. So we have issues on 10th, and we also have issues on 1st and Highland with the high school. Um, if anybody's been by there at lunch hour, before and after school, they know that parking and traffic is crazy. And while the school district did build, um, they took some money from the general fund to add a smaller parking lot where the old fairgrounds is, that doesn't totally take care of it. High school students are drivers, we just need more parking. Um, he did talk about the California style schools, not just that, but modulars, where you've got the ability to go into a classroom from the outside. Um, that's a concern in the district. Uh, but we haven't been able to fix that issue. Um, and the last is? Traffic. Oh, traffic, which is the same thing. It's, you know, 10th and Highland and, you, you know, and there are other schools where there are problems that we've heard, you know, Desert View had indicated that they were having problems. They don't have enough parking. Um, and where the buses turn around, there isn't room for parents. So um, it's not just those, you know, it's not just Rocky and Highland, there are issues at other schools. So um, that's what we talked about. And so before we turn it over to questions, first I want to turn it over to our committee member, Mr. Goller, to say a few remarks. First off, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight on this beautiful spring night. I know there's a lot of different things that pull people in several different directions. Um, coming out and sharing your opinions with us tonight is really a crucial thing. Uh, I've been to several of these meetings and the feedback that we get I think is the most valuable part of this this process um, as was stated earlier on no decisions have been made yet we're still in the very early process of this and so uh, your feedback your input really will help the board and the committee make good solid decisions for our community in the future so I would like to turn it over to Mr. Wayland as we have our, our community input session and then before we turn it over to questions, for the folks joining us via live stream, um, since you are not here, there's an opportunity to still ask questions. You can send myself an email. Um, I'm on the website under the operations section. Um, my email has a link there, so you can either contact me via email or give me a call um, via my office line, which is 667-6119. Um, feel free to ask questions or raise some any concerns that you may have um, in terms of what the committee is doing. So with that said, I'll turn it over to the audience for any questions that you may have. Questions, comments, ideas? Well, I have a question. Were the 
enrollment obviously is just really going through the roof. But with new students come also new people to the area. And those people are taxpayers. Um, how can that not offset a little bit what we're looking at in terms of shared costs? So that shows a 2.5% increase, if I remember what uh, state, or the, the evaluation. The evaluation. Yeah, assessed value. 2.5% increase in assessed value. Assessed value. Yeah. Yeah, assessed not, value. not new taxes. Yeah. Th this is, right, okay. And, and really housing does about this much. You need a project like Amazon or uh, uh, Land West to really make a difference. And, uh, and aren't there some of those businesses that have been in some sort of enterprise zone that maybe are either on the tax rolls or coming to? Has that been factored in as you've really projected um, how, how some of these projects would impact yeah, the tax? The, the first part of your question is when um, our business manager and she works with they Never call them bond right. assessors. Um, they're basically um, CPAs with big brains. Not as big a brain as Stacy, though, but <laughs> big brains. Um, and they already factor in growth. So that's what we're referring to is the 2.5%. In order to do these numbers, that's why it's there's an art to try and figure out how to keep these numbers even. There is a 2.5% growth factored in based on that. So the short answer is, that a lot of that's already factored in. Um, when a business comes in, it really depends on what um, what agreement they've made with the city or the county. That some of the businesses that come in, it does impact immediately. A lot of the businesses that come in, however, they're given um, basically a hiatus for several years, and that almost depends on an individual agreement with the city, right. um, and, and rightfully so, to be honest, to bring those businesses in. So. It does make a difference, but it depends on the business, the agreement, and then if it's greater than the growth that's been projected or if it's a little less, then we might see you know, a change. But to be quite honest, it's usually pennies is usually what that change equates to. Good question. Other questions? Well, I have, I have the opportunity every once in a while to have lunch with my daughter, and she's at Desert View. And I was absolutely shocked when I went in to have lunch with my daughter that she only has about 12 minutes to eat lunch because of how packed they are. The modulars are full, and I think they're about eight, seven or eight people above the maximum capacity to begin with. And these kids are just getting in there. They're getting kind of shoveled through. Then you got the kids out in the modulars that are the last to come in. What school is that? Desert View. Desert View. Really, Desert View. And, like and so I, I see the things that you were talking about because even when I come to pick her up, you have to park way down the road to come and get your kid from the school because the entryway is so narrow and so short. And then the other parking lot with the buses in it and the teachers, there's no room for you to park over there if you had the chance to park over there. So it is a safety concern that I've known for you know quite some time. And I'm grabbing my daughter's hand as I'm leaving that door until I get to the truck. Yeah. And you know, I had the opportunity to vote on the last bond, and I thought, oh, the school district's trying to get more money from me. They've got enough money. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the opportunity to be asked to come to the committee and started to see each meeting mm -hmm. what exactly I was wrong about. And I have to admit, I feel really bad about voting something down when I got proven that I was absolutely wrong in my perception of what I saw there. And I know I'm not the only one. You know, I understand there was a miscommunication on, on some levels and stuff too, but we also got to think about this. Whatever we do, we're investing in our kids, and our kids are a part of our community, and as a community, <coughs> we should be doing everything possible to make sure that they're taken care of, they're watched, they're educated, and they're safe. And as a, as a parent and somebody that's been on this committee through the process, I've been wanting to do everything I can to try to get some kind of resolution to this. So think of the issue that the school board has, and I've tried to bestow this idea of voting, and they've not, some folks have not wanted to, as you've got to. You have to do this because the school board's gonna have to do this. So to help them understand that the decisions that the school board's gonna make are very, very difficult. So let's just take that um, the enrollment piece. So one thing you could do, uh, you could rebuild Highland Hills, or you could rebuild Rocky Heights, but it really doesn't do much for capacity, right? You'll just have about the same number of students. 
So the only way to really impact elementary capacity is build a new school up at Theater Lane. Okay, so you have, it doesn't solve all the issue, but it takes a, a stab at doing some of it. Um, so that's $30 million, okay, right there. So what's left? Well, you could build, rebuild one of the other elementary schools. Now you're at the 60 million, and now you're getting really close to the bond measure that passed a few years ago, which is probably about the amount of money, sort of, that uh, the school uh, board might be asking for in the future. So you've done nothing for middle school or high school. So that's the issue is that you can't, there isn't gonna be enough money to fix all the concerns that the district has today. And that's the, the piece that's gonna make it very difficult for the school board to figure out. Well, it's gonna be essential <laughs> that you, um, whatever comes out next, um, that you show that you have listened, though, to the lessons from the first defeat. And it, it money is the issue, um, and the amount that was there means that you, you have to start with just the smaller projects. And then the, the picture could change. I mean, maybe there will be, you know, some bigger things coming in that would increase the tax base, which would uh, change the the look of when you could go out within a so uh, I mean when we built the high rebuilt the high school in 98 or what it was we, we came off a string of defeats on the bonds um, where there had been a good plan presented but there had not been um, buy-in from the people that were going to pay the bill and every single time they went down and it wasn't until um, there was a, a true change in the approach and the, and the plan that was presented um, that we began a string of passing bonds here. So, I, I, I don't know. And you know, I think in a lot of people's mind, uh, if you're talking about elementary schools, um, ro it's Rocky Heights' turn. I mean, I, I don't think anybody would vote for um, not replacing Rocky Heights because everyone knows what that school is, and it's at the end of its life. So, so that's the problem, and it doesn't, and it doesn't help capacity. And so, if you build a, a new one for capacity and to, and build Rocky, then you don't have any more money. Well, the reason well, it doesn't do anything for capacity is because we have decided we're not going to make it any bigger than it well, is already. So, okay, then so there's another way to look at it. So let's just say our understanding from the committee is that as you get beyond 600 students. Each uh, square foot costs you more for each student that, that added until you probably get to 1,200 where you've doubled the size and then you have all the, the double music rooms, the choir room, the gymnasiums and so forth. So you build a 1,200 student elementary school and that's all your money. So you haven't done it, there's no money left at the, for the other schools. So you, you, you fixed the elementary situation at a 1,200 seat school for sure and you got beyond what you needed today but it doesn't fix anything right. else. So we, I think we're a little cavalier on the cost per student as the uh, footprint goes up <clears throat> because we really don't want to do it. And well, well, that's now, what we let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. Uh, so what we are doing is we're building schools for 600, knowing full well that in their lifetime we will have some number of modules at that school. So in fact, we may very well have 800 kids there easily before there's another school made. So I, <clears throat> I really think that we ought to take a deep breath and wonder if we shouldn't size everything for that 800 or 1,000 that will actually be there through modules so that we don't run into the problem of cafeteria, gym size, play fields, and, and all that. The other thing that, <clears throat> that I'm a little concerned about is that in our communications with the public, I really think we want to be careful about what we communicate because I think we're going to really confuse people. <clears throat> I think that the next mission is to get a bond passed that addresses as many needs as possible. Don't talk about the high school. Don't talk about the future plan. Don't talk about any of that stuff. Get this bond passed and then immediately start talking about the second high school or what, whatever the it is. <clears throat> but if we, if we package too much together and put too much on this committee, I'm a little afraid we're gonna have so much mission creep that we, we will never come out with something 
hard-edged enough to demonstrate to people, okay, this may not be what our first choice is, but you're paying for it. We're taking as many things into consideration and still meet our fiduciary responsibility. And I, I really think that Rocky Heights and a new school should be what we ought to really, really try to do. And figure out how to pay for uh, the improvements that have got to take place at, uh, at Highland Hills and maybe other schools. And maybe it's going to take five years to get there. I, I don't know. And then I'm not so sure that we shouldn't capture all of the security issues and make that a separate issue. It's and in the front of mind. mind a front, it's in front of mind of people. Oh, it is. And, and I think that if we can figure out either how to make it a part, uh, an essential part of the bigger picture or a companion piece or something, I think that we could, I think there's a chance that we could fund all of the security issues, which really essentially is single point of issue and some security. So nobody can just wander into the school from wherever they happen to show up. And some, you know, the security issue and condition of facilities, uh, there is some, some link there, right. you know, so that if you did deal with that, you might also actually be dealing with some other problems at some of these schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's probably, Kathy, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's one of the biggest quandaries that the committee is having is how to balance all these various projects knowing some pro, you know, some pro, some renovation or replacement projects will affect more areas than just enrollment capacity, and then you know, kind of like you had talked about, Steve is balancing all those in the most efficient, effective way possible, and that's that's why I am a non-voting member of the well, committee. Thank we, you. We know we're going to have, we know we're not going to get all that we like. To exactly. Have. So we want to we want to try to hit the sweet spot, and, mm -hmm. and I think. I really do think if we can get people that grudgingly vote for it, whether they listen to what I had to say, I'd have gone further, but it made a difference. My vote made a difference. Mm -hmm. I think it'll help us. Well, I, certainly we've heard that communication in, in the community uh, could have been better. I'm not sure how to make it better, but I, I do know that there was a lot of folks that didn't know the issues with the school district on the 104 million. Bill, they make up their own answers. I mean, I talk to a lot of people. Who's here? All the people already know this stuff. Well, and and they, so we can't get them to come out. So they will talk about this in their own way. And One of the things that was mis miscommunicated, at least to me and my family and friends, when we went with the bond issue and stuff was, there wasn't enough information on the age of the structures in the district and what was needed on those structures. And if there was a little bit more definitive input on there, you could get, because we're, we're very visual people, mm -hmm. and if we can get it in our mind's eye that that's what it's gonna take to get it to that position, then you know, the communication would have hit me a little bit better. You know, I found out after the deal that I was wrong in, in my vote, and you know, I, kind of, you know, I still feel bad about it, but, I had the information that was in front of me, and I did not realize that, you know, Highland Hills was 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I talked to, at friends and family, thought it was 10 years old. <laughs> they thought sandstone, except for my mom who taught sandstone, <laughs> knew exactly when that was done. But they're like, oh gosh, that was not, what, 15 years ago? No, it was 20 years ago. You know, it, they just didn't have the conception that we hadn't caught up to where we actually needed to be, and it just wasn't communicated that well. And I hope that we can get that kind of communication out so where there's less questions in people's minds. So I, I well, really even the people, it. though, that knew, know that Sansone is 30 years old, Stacy, you kind of hit, hit it on the, the head. I mean, you, you went to school right. there, your kids are there. Um, you you know the ins and outs of that school, yeah. and it's still a good school. Yes, it's, and 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 so it's thirty, but Rocky Heights is you know fifty some, and and if if we're running out of space and we need a new school, then the the priority line for most people in rebuilding um, Highland Hills mm -hmm. is low. Yeah because we don't have the money to do all of that. Right. And so, it, it, again, it's prioritizing and figuring out what people will accept. Even if they have the numbers and the information, they're still calculating, you know, what really 
um, will be the best. And one of the benefits from from previous meetings, previous community meetings that we've done, is a comment that's kind of along the lines of all of what you said is we're going to be doing videos to kind of do a walkthrough of the various facilities to con you know to the best of our ability. Um, mimic what was done with okay. the committee because I think the committee, you know, everybody who went on the various tours, they said it was an eye-opening experience. You know, if they haven't been in, you know, one school and they're just driving by, you know, their perception of it's going to be vastly different than walking into the building when and it was, seeing it up close and personal. We were giving a presentation here in the bell rings and it's been a long time since I've been in middle school or high school and it was just flooded and I'm going, oh, and, and then the people in the audience said, they need to see that. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, I, it was really packed. So, so, yeah. One of the other things we've heard from uh, these meetings is that uh, open houses for folks in the community, it would probably be as well attended as tonight and, and last week, but those are the real eye-openers if they've not been in school. Right. But uh, one thing that when I was on the school board, when we tried to pass, and I, we were always successful, I think, when I was on the school board. <laughs> um, and that is that uh, we tried to do something for everybody in the community. So you did something at Highland Hills, you did something at Rock, you did it so that all the parents could see that there was some benefit to them. I don't know how you make that that way, you know, because, you know, it's just more difficult because of the limited pie. So we have to somehow, and, and I was telling Tricia tonight, I remember going door to door with my, with my daughter when she was a senior in high school for the Desert View Bond. And we had a section of town and, and we did that one Saturday morning and somehow we have to get connected to everybody. They're just not, they're busy, uh, they're, they're thinking of other things, but I think that everyone in the committee, uh, so since I'm the only carryover, I was kind of familiar, but you know, there's folks on the committee that wasn't aware and, and their average community members, and we just need to educate the community members on what the real situation is. Because I really think if they were educated, we have a yes vote. Well, you know, maybe. Uh, there, is, there is a maximum pocketbook issue, no matter if you believe it or not. Now, oh, I, I want good facility for my grandkids now. But I don't want to build a new school that's just 30 years old. I'm willing to refurbish it unless it's clear you can't so that I get another 30 years. And I, and I, think, I think it's those kind of uh, making people understand that, that we're doing really what we feel we have to do. We could do more, we maybe would like to do more, but really paying attention to the cost. Yeah. Yeah. And if we could put $10 million, I don't know, in Highland, get another 20 years out of it, fix most security issues. That's a different question than 30 million for a new school to say, well, it's only 20 years old or whatever it was. So Steve, I'd even tell you, this wondering about uh, the number of dollars that the school board might have, is that uh, there, if you want to fix capacity, you build a theater lane. If you want to fix the issues that are there today at Rocky Heights, you build a new gymnasium and whatever, mm -hmm. and that you, when you actually rebuild that school, you, you use that, you tie that in and tear down the rest or something like that. Because I think what's going to happen is that once the school board adds up whatever projects that we as a committee provide them, they're going to run out way before they get to the bottom of the lesson. So, uh, you know, I wanted to rebuild Highland Hills, but I really believe that the, the, the majority of the people in town or a significant number of voters didn't believe that that was needed. Right. And because I, the security was what was high. I wasn't convinced by that when I read it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the other thing I think, if we had a blank sheet of paper in those schools, we might do it a lot different. And maybe that's part of the long range planning. Maybe, maybe we ought to think about it like we were one big college and we have a sports complex that's, that all these schools are in mm -hmm. and that they all use the facilities that's big enough for everybody and you deal with the timing issues. I don't know if that's the answer, but we're gonna have, we cannot put 30 million out every two years for a new school. Oh, we can't do it. Absolutely can. Yeah, and so uh, that was thinking that should have been done 20 years ago because now we have 
all the property and the opportunity uh, to do, you know, provide these things. And that would, we'd have to bus kids and stuff and so forth, but that might be a, a more serious to show the folks that we, the, the voters that we are, the school district is actually looking at different, way different alternatives than what has happened in the past. And I don't know if we got one time of the, to do that, it's so much different. And, and that's one of the outcomes of the committee um, is to do a long range plan so that hopefully we're, we're addressing, addressing the needs with potential solutions where, you know, before a lot of the plans didn't really incorporate, it was just an immediate, this is what we need for this bond as opposed to 20 years out, you know, we might want to start thinking about this building or, you know, this building. And so well, that's one- want to get it tangled up with the primary exactly. issue. And, and I'm a little worried that we might, even on the committee, that we might get kind of confused. Our first goal is to get this bond, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of the issue that we've heard too, uh, either in an open meeting or afterwards, is the folks still don't understand how the stadium was built. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's still a black eye to some people yeah. and absolutely a godsend to others. Mm -hmm. um, I did, they don't understand it, and, and, and I was on the school board when that decision was made how to do with that kickback money. I still believe the right decision was made, and I'd really like to know how much money would have been returned to me if that would have been returned to me. It's probably not very much money. It would all be spent by now, and it'd be done, but we have a facility that's bringing millions in the community, and so. There was a lot of private money. No, but I'm talking about the kickback from the state. No, I, I yeah. know, but there was that's a right. lot of money. Oh, but people don't know that either. That's right. You know, Phil, some of it is I think there's some people that whether it was free, it's too grandiose. We, we just don't need something like that here in this little town. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I think there's, there's folks that come to that conclusion. It doesn't matter what the information is. Yeah. Well, and, and that, that mentality is why also that you will have people vote no on a bond even if they could afford to pay more taxes, if they feel like we're trying to um, create a Cadillac um, uh, system and we're taking perfectly good buildings that need a little update and tearing them down and starting over. So, I mean, the main thing is people have to see that, you're, um, that, that the planning and the vision um, for these bonds and the projects they will produce are to benefit our students and our um, and their education and that we're trying to balance that in the very with the best uh, use of money you know that it's we're not taking anything for granted we're you know um, you mentioned the bond that built the high school which is the first big one that really passed um, and, and there was something in that for every single school, and, and we planned it that way on purpose. That's right. And it took a lot of planning because there were primary needs that had to be met, but in the end, um, it, it's what sold the bond. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then you fast forward to this one or whatever it might be proposed, and there's this, that's sort of, from my perspective, that's kind of a political piece that we have to make everybody happy, but. As Steve's saying, and, and I, I agree with Steve, is that if we do that, then we, we, we lose some of our um, uh, focus on what has to be done more than anything else. No. You know? And it's a different situation now, too. It is a different situation because of the, the, that enrollment and the capacity that has to be dealt with. Yeah. Um, so, um, and one of the things that the committee has has come to the realization too is the shame is once again I kind of, I, I briefly talked about things aren't getting cheaper but just to give a perspective the last bond was 104 million dollars to do all those projects now and it's only been about a year and a half but it's 140 million now yeah. and because yeah. it's more than just inflation construction costs have really risen and so the shame is that the buildings aren't getting any younger and costs aren't going to go down anytime soon. In fact, it'll just continue to escalate and that will just continue to contribute to the problem, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because with the age of a lot of the buildings, maintenance is a high cost yeah. on the structures. Mm -hmm. And we 
don't have the opportunity to really invest what we want to because of what has to be maintained at this point. And a lot of people don't, you know, realize that. They think, oh, you know, they're only doing the minimum amount of thing and they're keeping the rest of the money in there. Right. But the walk around that we did on all the different structures, Marty and his crew are doing a fantastic job for what they got. And I was really impressed that uh, they were able to keep things together yeah. when they should actually be just dilapidated. Yeah, I agree with you. And it was amazing how little thought was given to the maintenance that was going to have to be done when we built those buildings. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, I have an idea on the on the school, uh, the high school. I think everybody ought to have a parking pass and have to pay to park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we're paying for the busing, and, and if they're empty, I want my money back. And if you choose to drive, you can pay everywhere else and build a parking structure with the refund with, with that. Well, when I went to high school, if you were a senior, I think even as a junior, you paid a fee to have a certain spot oh. and it was guaranteed. But it was seniors first and then whatever was left, it, you, you better get there early for registration. <laughs> and, I, you know, I mean, I paid the fee. Mm -hmm. I paid the fee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's a pot. Any other questions or comments? Was this helpful? Yes, very, actually. And, and, that's, and that's one of the biggest things is that doing these, you know, hearing those comments, and then one of the things that I'll bring back to the committee is kind of a synopsis with the help of Stacy and Phil, since they've sat in on all these two, so that that way at least the committee does hear that feedback, because once again, we haven't made a decision at this point in time we won't make a recommendation to the board until we internalize a lot of those comments and then come to a decision and consensus with the committee. So what is the date of the bond if it occurs? Is it going to be spring or fall? It's That's a decision that the board has to make. The earliest, all I can really say, because once again, that's a decision that the board has to make. The earliest that we can feasibly do a bond would be May of next year just because of the lead time. But that's going to really be ultimately a decision for the school board itself as to when. Now, you know, that's one of the um, items that we're not, the committee's not going to make a firm recommendation on. This should be the timing. It's going to yeah. be, you know, here's some overall constructs in terms of raised taxes versus stable taxes and kind of, a, you know, a various grouping of projects as to what should be included. But ultimately, that's a decision for the board. Yeah, no, I'm not trying to get in the no, way I'm just thinking about. Yeah. It doesn't look like the economy is going to slow down any. No. 18 months from now, it seems going to be more yeah. expensive than a year from yeah. now. Yeah. And interest rates are going to go up. Uh, the Fed's promised that. Do we want to be in a period with a low voter turnout or a high voter turnout? Or do we know? It's, well, there's, and once again, the committee is briefed on, briefed on, Actually, I don't remember if the committee was briefed on this, so forgive me, but there are four times when oh, we, we can legally go out for a bond. And to be honest, I don't remember the two off months unless Jason or Josh well, remember. But, you, but, you but, but, but there's a, but, but that's the catch is that May and November are the times where we just have to get 50% plus one vote. The other two plus cycles, vote. it's a 60%. Well, and no, so, it's a double majority. Yes. So you have to have 50, 50, 50 plus one turnout. of the voters voting, and then you have to pass it by. But, but the voter turnout normally is a lot lower yeah. in spring than in fall. Yeah. And I don't, do we know which Historical is voter for data us? tells us that going out in the spring, we have more likely success. Okay. So, so statewide could, historical data tells us a November bond election is more likely to fail. Okay. So we really need to be thinking mm -hmm. about yeah. doing exactly. this a year from now. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming, and once again, um, for the folks joining us via live stream, um, I, my email is on the website. Once again, it's under the Hermiston School District website. You go to Departments, you'll see Operations Department, and then there's a link to my email along with my phone number. So thank you very much for coming, everyone, and we look forward to your input. Thank you.